in this segment, I want to talk about soft tissue, in, uh, soft tissue injuries. Uh, soft tissue injuries are basically sprains and strains. So when you land on a body part or twist a body part and then it really hurts a lot, that's a soft tissue injury. What they're not are open wounds, so you don't usually get infections in soft tissue injuries, and they're not breaks of bones. Uh, they often accompany, I mean, anytime you break a bone, you have a soft tissue injury. You have to do some drama in order to actually break a bones or bunches of little bones. Um, but I'm not going to be covering broken bones, just this extremely common event at lots of first aid, of, most first aid places I work at, somebody runs and puts their foot in a hole and sprains their ankle, or somebody's carrying something and falls and sprains their wrist. Those are the most common things to get sprained or strained, are the wrists and the ankles. Uh, we're going to show a demonstration about how to wrap wrists and ankles. Uh, that's helpful. It's also very easy, and it's fun to practice. You know, you and your friends, you get a couple of rolls of ACE bandages and just reuse them and learn how to get that correct tightness by asking the person you're working with. So, but we'll have some demonstrations on using that. So, soft tissue injuries, unless there's some technical problem with the person or some medical problem, really, um, tend to not be very serious as long as long-term ramifications. Generally, uh, they're self-healing if you pay heed to these common sense uh, applications. Number one, try to stay off of it. It's the biggest problem with them. So you run someplace and your foot goes in a hole and you twist your ankle outward and you hear a popping sound and it swells up and you got a lot of pain. We'll talk about how to treat that. But just to speak about what's happening to your body, the physiology, pathophysiology of what's going on, it's important. So you've just hurt a body part. You've just created trauma and injury. What your body's going to do, it's going to grow a cast. So instead of having to bandage it right away, you're going to make a natural bandage, and that's called inflammation. Uh, inflammation has a number of reasons to happen. It just makes a soft body kind of tissue cast. You could still bend it, of course, but it's much, more, it's much harder to bend uh, when you're inflamed in your ankles and wrists and hands. Um, also, it's going to bring in a lot of different parts of your white blood cells, a lot of parts of your immunity, in order to clean up any problems associated with it. So the reactions that you have to soft tissue injuries, to sprains and strains, is your body's response to these injuries that happened to human beings before we ever started walking on two legs. I mean, these kinds of injuries, you can imagine, are the oldest, some of the oldest things. These and infections are from our earliest days of being animals, things biting us for infections. And, and for these, it's just running away from things or running towards things and stripping and straining. So we have a lot of history with the body creating uh, inflammation and the other responses we have to soft tissue injuries, to sprains and strains. So you don't have to impede all of that. That's what I'm trying to say here. If you strain and sprain yourself, uh, letting it just happen and not treating it could be fine. But the thing that most people do to damages is they continue to use their wrists and particularly, and for obvious reasons, their ankles. So you sprain your ankle and you still want to walk. It's better if you give it some rest. Your body will do better repair every time you walk on it. Uh, you can't, it's not going to really do long-term damage. I mean, unless there's something really going on. But it's just going to take a little longer to heal. So just consider slightly elevating, especially if it's your ankle, slightly elevating it when you're sleeping. Putting a pillow under it is fine, right? Um, and try to stay off of it a little bit, as much as possible, really. It'll, it'll heal a little bit faster. So I want to talk a little bit about crutches and staffs. If you're going to use crutches, which is a useful thing, uh, what you want are the crutches to fit under your arms pretty naturally as you're standing naturally. So the crutches, I don't, I don't have any crutches with me right here. They'd be right here, and I'd be holding them right about here. Crutches are those human inventions that are useful. Um, and so that they fit pretty comfortably. And what you want to do is just, when you use the crutches, is just not put, when you step on the good when you step on the hurt ankles, to just use less pressure, use your crutches as a brace. I can't do it here with fake crutches, but I would be using my crutches, so less pressure on my foot, and then use the crutches, and then you can put full pressure on the other foot. And so the crutches are basically acting as a brace and support for your injury. Uh, for these kinds of for ankle injuries, don't use a cane. They're not really, canes are good for back pains and a few other places, but you could use them, but much better than a cane 
is a staff. Crutches are good and staffs are good. When you cut a staff, it should be shoulder height. That's the best height. You don't want it down here, right down here, because you're going to have to bend your back. So if you don't have a choice and just grab a stick, that's fine to take the pressure off. But eventually you want it at shoulder height. Just be as Gandalfian as you possibly can be. You can make yourself a nice staff. By the way, use wood that doesn't break, because I've seen people like use pine or something. They put it in the ground and it breaks and they just fall. Now they sprain their wrist as well. So a uh, good staff reaches your shoulder. Uh, it doesn't have to be anything special. Once again, so people do it on different parts of their body. Often I think it's better on the part of your body that's hurt, and it's going to be support. So when you step on it, you put it, you're using your arms and shoulders to support your foot, and then the other foot just holds natural weight. So that's strains and sprains to the ankle, which are really common, uh, knees as well. And just try to rest them a little bit. And sleep with them a little bit higher can be helpful. Of course, we'll talk about herbs that are useful there too. So your soft tissue injuries affect ligaments, tendons, and muscles. So often all three things, I mean, they're interconnected. Um, and your goal is to eventually reduce the inflammation and help your body restore the normal architecture to these different kinds of tissues. Um, if you're working with somebody and they just sprained or strained themselves, sometimes you want to feel around to feel the extent of their damage. You don't need to wear gloves unless they're bleeding. If they're just swollen or there's no blood there and they're not swollen, you don't need to wear gloves. You might want to wash your hands afterwards, but there's no big risk of infection. So you can ask if they have any infections that you should know about that you can't, that you can't see. So less risk in this department. Some of the reasons you would be concerned about sprains and strains with treating people, I guess for yourselves as well, um, that sprains and strains can get worse, right? If you, you can get, uh, if you keep damaging an area, it could start to get more damaged faster, easier. Not excellent grammar there, but uh, so you might want to help repair it quicker so you don't have long-term damage. Usually long-term damage just means it strains easier. It doesn't always, though. So some of the concerns uh, is the inability to perform, right? Whatever you're doing, if you sprain and strain your elbows, your wrists, your knees, they're joints, most of these things, by the way. It's not, you don't sprain and strain between your, uh, between your ankle and your knee. Usually you strain and sprain the joints, your ankles, your knees, your hips, I feel like I'm doing Simon Says again, elbows, wrists, hands, Simon Says. Uh, did I catch you there? Um, so long-term problems, implications, could be, the problem could become chronic. The pain could become chronic. The goal here is to try to reduce uh, the injury by using these herbs and just practices by not stepping on it so much or using your wrists uh, as to reduce the strain on them. You know where you see a lot of people have to deal with it is sports, right? Because like if you're a pitcher, you constantly use the same muscles over. But those pitchers at last have just figured out ways their body is endurable. And their ways to use their body just have to learn to cut down on sprains and strains from overuse. Uh, so when to seek help. So you're treating somebody and they have a sprain or strain. And you want to know at what level they should go for more medical help. Um, if the pain persists, persists too long, so that's one reason to go for medical help. Um, if there's extensive bruising, there might be more damage. So if they say, I hurt my wrist, and there's a lot of black and bluing, and that person doesn't normally black and blue. Some people black and blue very easy. Um, that's another reason, so extensive bruising around the area. The pain is just too much for them. Right, then you might also want to get medical help. Or if you just feel like you need further diagnosis, are you worried there's a break or some other problem involved, that might be another time to take it further. But a lot of these things you are certainly capable of working with, with yourself, with your family, with others. Uh, so as far as assessment, it's usually mostly visual and question asking. How did you hurt it? Uh, usually what people do is they turn their, I'm going to, if John shows his camera down here for a minute, usually for ankles, you turn your uh, ankle out this way. And so your bruising goes in over here is where the bruises are. Uh, knees, often from falling backwards, knees get a lot of different. And uh, wrists fall, go this way, right? More than, they can go this way too. But a lot of times with wrist injuries, it's people catching themselves when they fall. And so you get a lot of damaging up in here. So, but you can just ask. It's one way of assessing the damage and by looking at it. You can also palpate it. Palpating, you could feel it gently. 
to make sure it does, you don't do too much harm to feel the extent of the damage. And often you can just say, like, if they hurt their wrist, does this hurt? Does this hurt? Does this hurt? And they'll say, oh, right there. So, you know, kind of like up in here, you still have, you know, damage that goes in here, and you go, does this hurt? Does this hurt? And they'll go, yeah, right there. How about here now? So kind of this is your damage zone. This is where the pain, some of the changes are, with places that you will concentrate. So, you know, when you're, when you're trying to figure out the extent of their injury, your goal really is to just figure out where you want to treat locally. Internally, it won't matter, of course. So some of your initial, uh, initial assessment questions is how bad does it hurt, and assessing the patient's pain tolerance. Because one of the things you certainly might give them are pain medicines and trauma medicines. You might want to ask them to pantomime the accident to demonstrate when people, when somebody will come in with an injured knee, for instance, and I'll say, how do you hurt your knee? And they'll go, you know, I just, I injured it falling. And I might say, how? And so they might, you can help them up. They'll say, actually, I did something like this. And you're like, oh, because it's going to show you more where you're going to have damage. So if they kind of, you know, they don't have to reenact the accident entirely. That would hurt. But if they pantomime or show you how it is, sometimes it gives you a better extent. This is common, by the way. If people show you where pain is or re, kind of role play uh, how it happened, sometimes you get a much better visual and it gives you a better sense of where to focus uh, the medicine on or other forms of treatment. So ask them exactly how it happened and where does it hurt. These are questions to ask the patients while you're working with them, evaluating. So that's pretty much the beginning of soft tissue injury. We're going to talk now about uh, some of the treatments. The first question of treatment is the age-old question of hot or cold. So hot versus cold. The first thing to know, by the way, is that it's easier to make heat than it is to make cold. To make heat, all you need is a lighter or matches. To make cold, you need ice or an ice pack. So if you have an ice pack, we'll talk about it, it's easy. But if you don't have any equipment on you, right, your backpack and you don't carry your first aid kit, you might be able to find cold. You might find the cold stream, for instance. But there are many places where cold doesn't exist. On the other hand, you can almost always supply heat by just having a pack of matches, which most people backpacking will have, to, set, to make fires, for campfires. And then you can figure out how to warm water or something. I just want to say, as far as just availability, heat is easier than cold. That said, I would suggest also carrying cold packs. When I showed you the run bag, there's at least one or two cold packs. So let's just jump to the question of hot versus cold and why and when. The idea of hot and cold is pretty straightforward. So before saying when, the question is why. Cold, when you apply cold to the body, it has a slowing down and shutting off process locally. So if you apply a cold pack to an ankle, let's say, what's going to happen is the pores are going to close, the blood supply is going to get a little, uh, every, as everything closes up, you don't get quite the same amount of blood flow. We'll compare it to heat and then it'll make more sense. And the nerve transmission is a bit slowed down. So when you use cold, you're kind of slowing down the process of your body. So <clears throat> even though cold doesn't feel as good as heat to most people, it often will reduce pain by reducing nerve signaling. So cold is a better first choice. Cold will slow down the rate of inflammation, so you don't get swollen up as fast. And it'll, it'll slow down the rate, uh, the rate, really it's just inflammation again. It'll slow down the rate of the way the, the tissues change in that area. It's not going to stop everything, but cold is very good that way. So let me compare it to hot. It'll make it a little, make a little more sense. Heat does the opposite of cold. Heat invigorates an area. The pores open up. More blood flows into the area as more things open up, as blood vessels open up, as pores open up. And it innervates the nervous tissue. You start to feel the area more. But in general, humans like warmth better. I mean, given a choice between hot and cold to just, like, how does this feel? Most people say, ha, ah, to warm and ah, to cold, right? Which almost shows you ah, the opening and mm, cold, the closing. But that's the main difference. Cold, pores closing down, uh, transmission of pain signals slowing down, blood into the area slowing down. So it limits the rate of damage initially. So cold is a better choice initially. Heat, on the other hand, will increase healing. So excuse me, cold slows down the rate of damage. 
heat invigorates the healing process by bringing more white blood cells and healing constituents of your body into an injured area. So the best is really, you guessed it, cold and then hot. And actually alternating them is very useful. So cold closes it down and kind of limits damage. Then you bring heat into the area and you get more blood in, into the area. You just get more body potential to clear up the detritus associated with the injury. Then you can go cold again to kind of shut it down. So cold and hot alternating can be very helpful. So I hope that makes sense, but I want to say again, cold initially is good and then heat later to invigorate the healing process. Any questions, John, about cold versus hot? Oh, so John's question is excellent. Where do we get cold and hot from? So cold are cold packs that are chemical cold packs that you snap and they get cold. That's usually what I'm using. Also, though, if you have ice available, I rarely have ice available, but ice available will work. A very cold stream where you put the cloth in the stream, or actually if it's an ankle or wrist, you can just put it directly in. Uh, around where I live, half the year there's snow, right? So not all the time, but there's often you can just get snow and put your body part in the snow. Uh, for heat, generally compresses and warm baths or hot packs. So you can get those uh, heating pads where you crack open, the two chemicals meet, and they produce heat. That works great. You could also just heat some water and put the body part in the water, in the warm water. Or you can stick, uh, make a compress and stick war, a towel in the hot water and put that, let's say, on your elbow. Uh, usually with cold to endurance. Like you keep things in cold until like, you can't stand it anymore. And then initially just go back to the cold. Don't go for heat. So just keep going cold and kind of build up your resilience to, the, uh, to cold on your body. Uh, heat until it feels good and you feel relaxed. I, don't, I guess I don't really have, it's a great question John asked about how long. I don't have an exact number, but until it feels like it's done something to your body positive. Cold is the trickier one because people want it on less. Oh, I'm sorry, and one more important thing is hot packs, or excuse me, hot water bottles, which I carry in my first aid bag, work excellent for heat. Uh, they don't work, I don't know how well they work for cold, I've actually never tried it, but for heat, they work great. So you can just, if somebody injures uh, an ankle, you can get a hot water bottle, fill it hot water, make sure it's not too hot, and then you can rest it there and you get a lot of heat. The problem with that bag is it's just heavy, so that's always a consideration. So that's cold versus hot. Um, and on to specific applications. Uh, what you're going to start hearing is repeats of other categories of herbs that I've talked about which is good, right? You just learn a couple of categories, five, six, 15, 150 million, how many, and then you, once you learn them, um, you know, once you know a couple herbs in them, you find yourself really uh, well ensconced, you well knowledgeable for a whole bunch of different health conditions. So first let's go with uh, preparations. Some of the preparations to use for soft tissue injuries, sprains and strains, include compresses, which hopefully you know by now, but that's uh, cloth, in a hot, uh, cloth in a tea or hot water applied topically. Poultices, which is when you crush the plant and you put the crushed plant on you topically, like crushed chamomile flowers, for instance. Uh, essential oils. Some of the essential oils are very anti-inflammatory, so are helpful. Liniments. Again, a liniment is a plant in isopropyl alcohol, rubbing alcohol, but stronger than rubbing alcohol. So um, liniments can be very helpful here, like an arnica liniment. Oils, so infusing a plant in an oil, like an arnica oil, which we talked about with arnica, where you soak it in the extra virgin olive oil and have an oil ready to go. Uh, salves, which is an oil with beeswax added, and then soaks. So those are external applications. And then internal applications are tinctures and teas mainly. Uh, the two main ways that I get medicine into people. Raw plant in water, tea, plant in alcohol, tincture, but also things, of course, like glycerites and other forms of internal medicine. So glycerins, glycerites, tinctures. I probably use tinctures and teas the most when it comes to soft tissue injuries for uh, getting good results. Some of the essential oils that you might want to consider having on hand for this, there are three that I use more. One is very expensive but useful, and that's matricaria essential oil. And that is German chamomile, matricaria German chamomile essential oil. It's a good anti-inflammatory uh, to put on, but it's really expensive. But it does smell delicious, you know, just that smell of 
kind of apple chamomile smell. The other two are betula or birch. So one of the birches, like black birch essential oil, and wintergreen, galtheria. So we have matricaria, galtheria, which is wintergreen or a checkerberry or tea berry, and betula, which are the birches, and usually it's black birch. The way to use those essential oils is to put the essential oil in a carrier oil. So don't put it on directly. So let's say you had arnica oil, or maybe even better yet, you have some other infused oil that you might put on uh, this, maybe let's say castor oil or St. John's wort oil. And what you're going to do is put a small amount of the essential oil, something like three drops per ounce. Three drops, that's so not a lot, three drops, you know, those little bottles were an ounce. Three drops of essential oil per ounce of fixed oil is a pretty good amount. It's actually a pretty strong amount. These essential oils, Galtheria, Betula, and Matricaria, are anti-inflammatory. I don't use the Matricaria very much, but I use Wintergreen, Galtheria, the most. That's, I just have a lot of it, and it's just really helpful. And honestly, it just smells good. And there's no reason not to have, I like the smell of wintergreen. Methyl salicylates. So it's related, we talked about willow and salicylates. These are methyl salicylates, which have wintergreen smells and are also anti-inflammatory. So I suggest putting those in other carrier oils and applying them directly onto the place that's sprained or strained. Some of the oils to consider to use externally are arnica oil, calendula oil, uh, cayenne oil. Cayenne oil is a counter irritant, also called a rubefacient. The reason that you would use cayenne oil is to increase blood flow to an area. This is really helpful when you've had a long time sprain or strain, and so you injured yourself and it's just not healing, and it's kind of cold, cold meaning it's just stagnant, very little new change to your sprain and strain. Sometimes adding a little bit, the essential oils are good here, and so is cayenne. So what you do is you make cayenne oil, which is putting cayenne pepper in oil, and then adding really small amounts in a carrier oil. Just like I just said about essential oils, you don't put the cayenne oil on directly because it will burn like mad. So you take that cayenne oil and you dilute it in another oil and rub it on, but rub it on with gloves. Right, because if you rub it on, with, you, you could put it on your hands. It's not poisonous, but they might sting. But the worst part is, is you might touch your eye or other parts of your body, and it will burn like mad, especially your eyes. So cayenne oil will increase the blood flow to an area. That's called the counter irritant. It can be very useful. Initially, you don't need it, by the way. That's for later, what I call cold or stagnant um, sprains and strains, soft tissue injuries. Uh, comfrey oil could be helpful as well. Valerian oil can help reduce the level of pain. So just get valerian, wilt it somewhat, and then put that in a carrier oil. Castor oil is one of my favorite all-around soft tissue and other problem oils. So I buy the castor oil. I just Castor oil is pretty cheap, but I find it really helpful for mending these problems, especially when there's a lot of hardness and you're trying to loosen up some tissue. Then I find castor oil helpful. Also, uh, amongst these is St. John's wort oil. Uh, which is better if there's trauma to help reduce the trauma load, and lobelia oil, which again brings more energy and kind of invigorates the healing process uh, in a soft tissue injury. So again, some of those oils in these lists will be here are arnica, calendula, capsicum, castor, hypericum, lobelia, symphytum, uh, comfrey, and valerian. So really good, those are fixed oils. Those are plants in an oil base. Some of the non-herbal items I want to just cover and mention to have on hand, most of these you can have on hand at any time for soft tissue injuries. They're common, right? Ace bandages, elastic bandages, really. Uh, antiseptic wipes, just if you have to clean an area if there's blood. Uh, basins to soak an injured part in, to, especially if you're going to make a hot soak. Cold packs, hot packs, disposable gloves. I have duct tape here. Duct tape, I could, most of us can discuss the virtues of duct tape for way too long, but duct tape is a really, if you just need to wrap something and not move it, and you don't care about pulling a lot of leg hair off later, duct tape will work. I mean, duct tape is just strong. It's not very flexible when you make a couple of layers. You can use it to hold bandages on. You could also use it as a temporary bandage, uh, but of course, pulling it off is pretty painful and very gluey and sticky. But 
Often duct tape is all you have around, so it's just a consideration. Uh, hot water bottles, gauze pads, scissors to cut the bandages, tape, vet wrap as a self-stick wrap, and that's about it. So there's just a lot of things are useful to have, uh, and these lists will be there for these, uh, for these soft tissue injuries. So I want to talk now about the treatment categories. And then I want to talk about specific herbs within these treatment categories. So the treatment categories are anodyne. Once again, I feel like I'm playing Jeopardy. The treatment categories are $200, anodyne. Anodynes are pain relievers. Anti-inflammatories, a major category here. Astringents, in case they've torn things and you have to restore the tissue architecture to bring those cells closer together, as we talked about with wounds. Circulatory stimulants, in case the injuries get cold and you need to increase circulation locally. Emollients. Emollients, I'm going to fit in with the other category called vulnerary, and we'll get there in a little bit. Uh, hypnotics, or sleep aids. Uh, when people injure their, when people sprain and strain, they sometimes don't sleep well, and so you can help them sleep with some of the hypnotic herbs, which we discussed on the pain remedies. And then just pain relieving remedies. Uh, skeletal muscle pain, sometimes antispasmodic, inebriants, there's a whole, just helping them deal with the uh, strong pains that often accompany strains and sprains, pains and strains and sprains, sprains in the planes. Uh, relaxing herbs, anti-trauma herbs, skeletal muscle relaxants, and that's mainly it. I mean, so there's a whole bunch of herbs for the nervous system that's going on here, like to help with the trauma, to help with the pain, and then there's a bunch of herbs to help restore the tone to the area. So those are the ones I'm going to focus on. So once again, uh, those categories are going to really be anti-inflammatories, circulatory stimulants, and vulneraries. Those are the specific categories for sprains and strains. So anti-inflammatories I've covered. I just want to talk about a few that I use more commonly for this internally and externally. It's actually the ones I tend to use the most. I tend to use plants a lot that I've used because I have a tendency to use what I've used. I just I feel more confident with something that I've seen work. And every once in a while, like these days, I've been adding more and more Jamaican dogwood as a pain reliever into things. But I usually pick one or two plants. Usually means, by the way, like with Jamaican dogwood as a pain reliever, I just gather it a bunch and now I want to play with it. So some of the anti-inflammatories uh, that I'm going to put in here, Arnica. Arnica is very specific for sprains and strains. Externally, as a liniment. Uh, so we talked about Arnica in some detail in the Materia Medica. So I would say go there for most of it. But as a liniment, uh, externally, in isopropyl alcohol, as an oil, externally, with itself or by other herbs. And once again, small amounts internally in tincture. So if somebody has a bad sprain or strain, uh, somewhere around an adult person, somewhere between one to three drops every two to four hours the first day, and then one to three drops every four to six hours the second day, and keep that up. So small amounts regularly. And if there's any question about Arnica, if you haven't listened to the part of this about Arnica, I was just going there, because I do use Arnica regularly in tincture form internally without having problems at that level. Make sure you keep your Arnica tincture, though, away from uh, hands that might use it incorrectly. So what that arnica is one of the most classic. Calendula is excellent externally too. Uh, gently anti-inflammatory, but also just good for helping restoring tone. So calendula oil externally, but internally drink a buttload of calendula tea. Better than calendula tincture for this. Just if you have calendula flowers, make a really strong infusion with them, so pour a bunch of hot water on a bunch of calendula flowers, and try to drink a really strong tea uh, a couple of times a day. A couple of cups of strong calendula tea is really helpful here. One of the herbs to add to your calendula, and this is going to be a little bit controversial, but I'm not going to talk about it in a way that is controversial, which is comfrey. So comfrey is often debatable how much people should use it as far as internal use. So let's start externally. Externally, it's just safe. So comfrey is just really good to apply as a poultice. Uh, so that a poultice is when you take the plant and crush it up. Comfrey is a good poultice. So you, you heat it for about an hour in hot water. You cook it in hot water for about an hour, and then you 
uh, take some kind of smasher, right, and crush the comfrey root and then apply that topically on, on the sprain part. Very helpful. And if there's breaks, comfrey is helpful there too. Uh, comfrey is basically a cell proliferant here. So if there's open injuries, be careful, as I've talked about in other segments. But it's useful here. It's also useful to drink it. So, oh, I'm sorry. So back to external. You can make compresses, which work great. Very strong comfrey tea. Lots of root here. That's going to be stronger for this. Soak a cloth in the root and then wrap it on the afflicted part. Try to do it a few times a day. Comfrey can just really speed healing here as long as there's no open wounds. So compresses and poultices and then just soaks. If somebody has an injured area, just soaking it in comfrey tea. As long as it's not open, they're going to have quick cell proliferation, which might trap in bacteria and cause wounds, or infections. All right, so internally. So I'm just going to quickly, comfrey contains a group of chemicals called pyrolizidine alkaloids. There are many pyrolizidine alkaloids, abbreviated just like Pennsylvania, the PA. So it, uh, I will say there's always a raging debate, but in short-term use, comfrey seems pretty safe for pretty much everybody except for very young children. So I wouldn't give comfrey tea to any infants at all. Uh, but for most adults, children, and teenagers, if you're going to use it limited for a week, even strong comfrey tea, it looks very safe. So I'm saying that having read lots and lots of literature by people on both sides of the fence. And it seems the one thing we can say about comfrey is that it's safe use uh, for short term. So a week of drinking comfrey tea is good. After that, just start consulting and reading all the literature and all the scat flinging that's associated uh, with comfrey. Um, but I do want to put out one caution. If you have liver disease, don't use comfrey. If you have, I, there might be reasons to use comfrey here, but why bother with it? So the reason to bother, by the way, with comfrey is just one of the best cell proliferants. But it creates, whether, whatever comfrey does is a question, but the, some of the kinds of pyrolizidine alkaloids create liver havoc. They create what's called veno-occlusive disorder. It's not, it's a very unfriendly kind of thing to have. So, but it, it's just much more to say about it. Use comfrey for about a week internally, even strong amounts of the tea, and then discontinue the use. And that way you don't have to consider all these other parts, unless you have frank liver damage, and then don't use comfrey at all. So if you have cirrhosis of the liver, for instance, or if you have hepatitis, I would avoid comfrey. Uh, I would just say in this case, so John has asked internally, I, I would use, so the, the leaf has less of these, but I would suggest drinking strong root teas and then just discontinuing them sooner. So instead of drinking leaf tea for longer with less PAs, drink stronger root teas and then discontinue them after about a week. And that just seems very safe. Please do your own research if you have any questions. Have fun with the research. Um, I, I want to say, though, my opinion here is pretty well formed by lots of input and really trying to understand it because I don't want to injure people and yet comfrey is a mainstay for me in soft tissue injuries. This is it. This is, like, this is where comfrey shines, broken bones and soft tissue injury. So I like to use it a lot. Uh, externally safe, internally uh, I would limit its use to a, to a week. So I'm still in anti-inflammatories. Uh, turmeric, you can use both externally and internally. You can make strong teas of turmeric. But the way that I like to use turmeric as an internal agent is to buy turmeric powder, which is really inexpensive, and stir it in a cup so you get, you know, here's my cup, it's about this much water, and stir in about a half to one teaspoon of turmeric, probably initially one teaspoon of turmeric, and just stir and drink. So not even a tea. Turmeric powder stirred into water and drank down. And try to get two or three of those cups in you a day, the day you hurt yourself, one or two cups for the next couple of days afterwards of a teaspoon of turmeric powder in water. You can also put it in food, but heating it alters it a little bit. So that's one of my favorite anti-inflammatories. You can also make a paste out of turmeric. Like when I made a paste or a slurry out of charcoal, you could take turmeric powder and add water, and you could put that on top of the area too. It's, going to be, it's not going to be as uh, dry as with the activated charcoal because they do different things. Uh, activated charcoal is drawing. This is going to be anti-inflammatory. But remember, if, like, if you put turmeric, it's going to stain your clothing yellow. It's not, initially it's beautiful, but actually it kind of stains, as it gets dirtier, it's not quite as pretty. 
So I'm just warning you that turmeric is beautiful and fun to stain with, but you might not want it on all your clothing. Uh, on your skin, it won't wash off fast, but you'll slough it off within a few days. So you can just make turmeric, make a strong, you could also take the turmeric uh, roots if you have them, crush them up and apply those as a poultice topically or a strong compress. So turmeric internally and externally as an anti-inflammatory. Licorice. Uh, I'm going to use it internally here. Licorice is one fine anti-inflammatory. So make strong licorice tea and decoct your licorice sticks. So cook your licorice sticks for at least 15 minutes in a medium boil and try to just drink like a couple of sticks to a uh, quarter. So maybe if you have smallish pieces, like maybe this big, maybe five to ten of them uh, in a quart of water, medium boil, ten minutes, try to drink one to three cups a day of licorice. If you are hypertensive and high, high blood pressure and you know that you're sensitive to licorice, then avoid licorice here. So licorice, though, I mostly use uh, internally as an anti-inflammatory, and it works very well here. Uh, I would say, so there's, if you look on the list, you'll see other anti-inflammatories. These are some of the main ones. Uh, I want to add one more. So, uh, so willow is really helpful here, too. So willow uh, drank strong teas, strong tinctures, and applied topically uh, all the same way. So willow usually is a compress. Really strong, decocted willow teas compress on a sprained area. And while you're making that tea for the compress, drink a bunch of it too. So drink willow a couple of cups a day. So, you know, just pick and choose. You don't have to do all of these things. In fact, that'd be horrible. That'd be, you, you would be bloated and full of nasty tasting anti-inflammatories. But you could add them together or mix them. But it's nice to mix up your anti-inflammatories and don't rely on one. So some licorice, some willow, some comfrey, some calendula, and then just drink teas. You can also make tinctures, but teas are going to, these plants tend to be starch rich and make better teas than tinctures. So I'm suggesting uh, making teas and drinking them daily. It'll help, right? It should help anyway. If it doesn't help, I apologize and hope that something else that you figure out does help. Uh, healthcare is, is a little bit random and it's who it helps the best at different times. So that's anti-inflammatories. If you have torn skin, consider astringents, and we covered astringents um, and infections. Circulatory stimulants. Most of these circulatory stimulants also fit into the category of rubefacients and counter-irritants. What happens sometimes is you strain yourself and the area just doesn't heal fast. So what you want to do is increase the healing so you can just apply heat but what else you can do is you can apply herbs topically to invigorate them and to get your blood supply active in that area. What you're basically going to do is make them hot and irritable. You're going to put things on there to kind of increase the warmth of an area. So initially, you don't need it. Initially cold, reduce it, and then later some heat. But if it, you, know, you sprain your wrist, three weeks later it feels terrible still. One thing to consider is putting circulatory stimulants or rubefacients. They're really different things. Generally, a circulatory stimulant is something you take internally to stimulate circulation, so I'm probably using these words incorrectly. When you're putting it topically to bring blood to an area, really that's called a rubefacient or a counter-irritant. Those words are synonymous. Counter-irritant, to bring irritation. Rubefacient, ruba means red, to bring reddening. Circulatory stimulants, really, when you take it internally. Most of these, I'm talking about actually using them externally right at the spot. Though sometimes internal circulatory stimulants will help. So I hope that makes sense. Some of the external circulatory stimulants, you can imagine the king, queen, and court jester, once again, of these is cayenne. So getting cayenne locally, whether you're going to make a poultice with it or a plaster with it, but it's going to burn. Be careful. But use small amounts. You can make an oil with it and apply the oil topically, as I mentioned previously. That would bring more blood flow into the area and help reduce the damage and increase circulation. And so it might help resolve a long-term sprain or strain that's not getting better. So really, first, cayenne is really the best. Uh, but ginger has some of this activity. Internally, you can drink some. Ginger tastes pretty good. Also, compresses, uh, oils of ginger, and uh, poultices of ginger locally are helpful. Prickly ash, which I haven't talked about at all, is helpful here. There's a couple of species. The genus, still with me here? The genus of prickly ash is xanthoxylum, which means yellow wood. Xanthoxylum, yellow wood. And so xanthoxylum 
Uh, you can make oils out of it, and tinctures, and liniments. And I'm not going to talk too much about it, but prickly ash is a good counter irritant. It's a good circulatory stimulant internally and locally. Not as strong as cayenne. Cayenne is just stronger than all these things. Uh, but also, if you use it topically, it'll bring some blood flow into the area. So prickly ash, which always seemed like it should be a name that somebody should have gave me at one point. I always feel a bit prickly ash-ish. So uh, it's very prickly, though it is not an ash. It's in the orange family. It's a rutaceae. Um, and the last I'll mention here for a circulatory stimulant externally and internally is bayberry. My favorite of the bayberries is Myrica, M-Y-R-I-C-A. So not barberry, not booberry, but bayberry. Uh, it's the stems. When you gather the bayberry, it's the uh, inner bark of bayberry, especially the inner bark of the roots of Myrica bayberry that grows in the south, Serifera, that's often called wax myrtle. And that's a really nice, it's, by the way, that plant does two things great. It's a counter stimulant or it's a counter irritant. And bayberry uh, is astringent. It actually shows, I'm not going to cover it here, but uh, for, si for excessive runniness in the nose, Myrica or bayberry is great. Putting it in a neti pot is very helpful, but also here as a counter irritant uh, for uh, old, old soft tissue injuries that haven't healed. We're getting there, kids. Uh, so now we have pain relief, whether it's skeletal muscle. If it's skeletal muscle, use skeletal muscle pain relievers or inebriants or general relaxants. Rubifacients is really just what we talked about with counter irritants and stimu uh, circulatory stimulants. Trauma aids. And the last category, the last category is specific for soft soft tissue injuries. The softest, by the way, is my Long Island accent emerging after all this. Uh, both of my parents, I grew up on Long Island, but both of my parents are more city dwellers, Brooklyn and, you know, Queens. And so if you're wondering about the accent, which probably nobody has ever heard a New Yorker talk before is not, John has asked me many times, especially on the plant walks, if I would affect a British accent. But as, I, as you saw there, I'm terrible at British accents. Uh, for a while, I tried to diminish my New York accent, thinking somehow it would impinge my ability and people, it's true, some people listen to me and they hear a New York accent, I don't know what they, they want to call me Vinny and I don't know what they're going to think, like, do I know any rural skills? I did grow up on Long Island, but I've lived a long time rurally. Uh, right now I have electricity, but 10 years without it. But no matter where I've lived, here is my accent. And so I'm not giving it up. In fact, I am proud as hell of my New York hey, accent. So. Uh, but I don't have quite the Long Island accent. I don't say mall, so quite, I haven't gotten there yet. But maybe someday I'll eventually get into my law. I'll say coffee and mall. So you didn't need to know any of that. But a little bit of personal information. It's making John laugh. And poor John. Like, you're listening to me, and I'm watching the camera. But he has to sit there while I prattle on. You get to turn this off, right? You're watching this, and you get to turn this off and turn it on and say, what the hell is he talking about his Long Island accent? And why does he move his hand so much? And John just has to sit there patiently watching it. So John, I just want to make sure that John gets accolades here. This is John Gallagher. He's not going to turn the camera on himself. But, you'll, but John has been fantastic with this. I've really resisted. I am going to go back to this whole topic, believe it or not. But I want to say that John Gallagher has come here, has worked with me. I've always been very resistant because I, I, there's a certain level of commercialization that I worry about, but a certain amount of putting it out there that I want to do, just like here with soft tissue injuries where I have a lot of experience. And John's been fantastic uh, to work with. And so I feel he's a great person to support. So you will have to pay to get this, but this guy is going to put many, many thousands of dollars with so me doing this. But really, I'm just talking for a couple of days. And of course, it's based on experience. So there's a part of me that's important here, of course. But also what John's doing, what Althea's doing, what Rosalie are doing, is really allowing this to go forward in a pretty simple manner so it's not crazy expensive. So thank you, John Gallagher. Wave to John. Thank you, Althea, who I've never met. Thank you, Rosalie, who I don't know very well, but we'll get to know soon. And now, I'm going to talk about vulneraries, which are often emollients. Vulneraries, as I mentioned briefly with infections, vulneraries are wound healing herbs. They're not for infections. They're not for open sores. They're to heal tissue, connective tissues, muscles, and tendons uh, after an injury. Some of the anti-inflammatories I mentioned are also vulneraries. The important thing to know about vulner vulneraries is that they're often emollients. Emollients are vulneraries 
that are starch-based and soft and mucousy in consistency. So classic emollient, for instance, is slippery elm or comfrey. These very, these very starchy plants um, that you put on that you put on tissue or tendons, connective tissue that help restore tone. So the first thing to know about vulnerabilities is because they're rich in starches, they tend to not make very good tinctures. Uh, Alcohol is not the best extracting agent for mucopolysaccharides, or just polysaccharides, these starches in these plants. So they're much better teas. So I would suggest with all the vulnerabilities I'm talking about is to make strong decoctions with them or infusions or other ways of preparing them, but water-based preparations. But remember, they are starch-rich and they will grow bacteria within a few days. If you're doing these outdoors every day, you have to get rid of them. Because, you know, if they're not on open skin, you could potentially use them from one person to the next, or at least on the same person for a few days. But comfrey tea, after a few days, is totally rancid from bacteria because it's starch-rich, sugars in water, bacteria and other organisms are happy to live in it. So these plants I'm going to mention now uh, generally are better teas. It's, there's some exceptions. But the best vulnerabilities here, well, arnica, is a vulnerary that, even though it has some starches, defies what I just said. Arnica does defy some of this, uh, and because arnica does work really well as a tincture uh, and as an oil, but you can mash it up in a tea and make a compress or a poultice out of it. Uh, so arnica is one of the plants here. Arnica, though, is stronger and has to be used with more consideration because it's not just starch-rich. It has other chemicals in it that are clearly very active, which is why you can't drink a lot of it. Uh, marshmallow uh, is very useful here. So marshmallow is a very starchy root. You know, it doesn't have to be marshmallow. It could be hollyhock roots uh, or it could be malva roots like musk mallows or cheeses, the malva species. All of them are good emollients. Now what you do is you take the root and you cook them and you decoct them and then you mash them and you can use them as a tea, but they're better as poultices. So you take your crushed marshmallow root and you put it on, a, you kind of lay the crushed root, so you boil the root, you've crushed it down with some kind of crushy thing, then you li line it in the inside of a cloth, and then you put the cloth, while it's still warm, against the ankle. So one way of working with uh, marshmallow roots and a couple of the other plants is to make these kinds of compresses and poultices. This is a poultice. Crushed plant, uh, apply it on the inside of a cloth, and put it on there. And sometimes you can put a hot water bottle, even on both sides, to keep the heat for longer. So that's marshmallow root as an emollient vulnerary applied topically. Uh, I've talked about comfrey a few times. Comfrey can be used exactly the same way. Comfrey does speed up healing a little bit more uh, than marshmallow but marshmallow is just a common plant that can easily be used. It doesn't have all the aspects of comfrey, but you don't always need all the aspects of comfrey. Slippery elm, same thing. With slippery elm, though, if you just have the powder, you can just put the powder in the water so you don't have to make a tea and make, uh, and make a slurry out of the uh, slippery elm powder. So take powder, put it in water, just like turmeric, stir it up, and now you have a very mucousy consistency uh, fluid. Put that on a cloth, put that while it's nice, if it's hot if it's better. You don't have to make a tea, but heat will help. And then again, water bottles or some kind of heat source. And that'll also help restore tone to it. Remember, if, these, if the wounds are, if the injury is open, these things can cause infection. They're not, they don't have bacteria, but you're putting starch-rich plants. You don't want to put starch-rich plants on a place that potentially gets infected. But if it's just a strain or a sprain, the skin's not open and you're not going to easily get an infection. Plantain is useful. Plantain is also an emollient vulnerary. With plantain, again, throw plantain in hot water, cook it up for a while, crush up the plantain. You can make a spit poultice, but this works better. You get a bunch of plantain leaves. I tend to use plantago major or plantago minor. I put them in hot water, I cook them up and I stir them up, and then I crush them up. You know, that you can crush them up with your hands, you can use a rock, you can use the top of a hammer. There's lots of ways to crush mortar and pestle. And then you take the plantain leaves, same exact thing. You could just put the plantain leaves directly on, but it's better if you put the plantain or any of these on a cloth, put the cloth on and while it's nice and warm, and then add heat to the outside of it. This is just if you have an ankle sprain, so that the heat keeps, that, uh, keeps the pores open. 
to allow the plant material to seep deeper into the body. So those are some of the classic vulnerabilities. So really the last category here. I'm just going to sum up, but just to sum up the vulnerabilities, uh, there's other things like aloe that could be used. But the ones that I use the most are arnica, marshmallow, calendula, plantain, and comfrey, uh, and slippery elm. So those are some of them. They all work. They all work slightly differently. Once you understand the specifics, by the way, of the plants, it makes all of this much easier because you, like they all do things slightly differently, and so they're just helpful in different ways. So I'd like to sum up soft tissue injuries uh, by saying that they're really common, that they often, unless you do something crazy afterwards, or there's something you can work with because they don't always get, they often don't get worse. They don't, they're not, tendency is not towards infection. The biggest problem is overuse of a hurt body part so it doesn't heal as fast, and then you have chronic pain. So that's a consideration. Learn your basic herbal categories for treating soft tissue injuries. Uh, teach patients how to use crutches and how to stay off their body. Get people to drink those uh, anti-inflammatory teas and put them on topically. And then you have a pretty good handle on how to treat soft tissue injuries. So thank you for bearing with me for yet another part of Herb First Aid or Herbal First Aid. Mm -hmm.